Hi there and welcome to another little demonstration. This is going to be, uh, I believe this is Textile Lighthouse, I might be wrong. But um, this is a, a great picture from Unsplash. And um, I'll put the details of the picture below. And what I'm doing with this one is, well I really was attracted to the perspective in it actually. I love the way that the road flows through and rounded up the hill. But also it's quite an interesting palette. I think the, the very bluey greens and the bright red of the lighthouse that's just a nice it's just a nice image so this is what i would call a, a sort of full process video so you're in it for the long haul it's about 40 minutes long just to warn you um and uh, we're going to be going through the process from start to finish now what i'm doing here is i am looking at the image on my tablet which is off to the side you can't see it and and I'm saying the road, I and mean, you can see from the reference image in the top left, the left hand side of the road is coming down to that corner of the page, of my page. Um, the right hand side of the road comes down to about, you know, about a fifth of the way across from the right hand side at the bottom. And I'm looking at those proportions. I've put in a rough horizon. It's about, you know, not a third of it's between a third and a half of the way up the page now i don't think that's the nicest of compositions i wouldn't normally want to be 60 40 i think that's not a nice split for me i like to be two thirds of the way up or down or halfway i don't like that you know 60 40 thing but at the end of the day this is a demonstration i'm not too bothered about the composition I'm just trying to go through the process really Okay, so here what I'm doing is I'm zoning out the picture. Now, what I mean by zoning it out is um, it's not losing myself in some kind of uh, hallucinatory trance. Although that just what it feels like painting sometimes. Is what I'm doing is I'm, I'm basically using the pencil to denote area. So I'm saying this out is the outline of this house. This is the outline of the roof. Um, you know, I will put in an outline of a uh, a window there is a sort of school of thought that says you should start from the outside of a painting and work your way in uh, because that way you can maintain symmetry and proportion a little bit better but I tend not to sort of follow a lot of these rules I I tend to just have a go um, which is one of the reasons why sometimes when I look at my picture is it's not necessarily a true um, accurate representation of of the facts as as they are there but the thing about art for me and it's different for everyone but is it's not wholly a visual record you know it's it's i wouldn't say it's an emotional record but i guess you know um if sketches take you back to certain times and memories but it's a, re a record a recording of you know feel it can be a, you know smell atmosphere all those things you know you will capture in a sketch particularly if you're there i think you know i have some sketchbooks where i can see i've been working in windy days and the watercolors literally zoomed across the page you know that that's quite a tactile um that's quite a tactile evidence of of the environment that you're working in uh, but that said i do like to be at home cozy with a nice reference image <laughs> so yeah I, i'm not one of those hero painters or a lover of the sublime i'm no words worth strolling the lake district uh, i'd like to but unfortunately i've got a job and kids that need uh watering and things like that okay so what was a, what am i chuntering on here so yeah i am um adding in some some of the details with pencil uh and more often than not i like to go straight in and just use pen i'm not a huge fan of uh of, of pencil I tend to find that it makes me somewhat more hesitant um, and I tend to get a bit fiddly after I've done this drawing uh, I actually revisited this reference image and I did a similar side a similar uh, picture in a small 7x5 pad uh, that's got much better quality uh, watercolour paper on this is a grey pad the cheap these are uh, a pink pig part and it's it's really good value for money wise but it doesn't just doesn't take what because it's not watercolor paper it's thick cartridge paper and it just doesn't take um 
it doesn't take the watercolour pigment quite as well or evenly as, as some of the more professional pads, but it's perfect for this kind of work. Um, so proportionally, I think the lighthouse is perhaps a tiny bit big here. Uh, looking at the ratio of the height of the lighthouse and my pencil drawing to the overall width of the of the village and the hamlet, it's probably the height of the lighthouse and the reference image is probably about half the, the, the width between the houses um, on the horizon, if you know what I mean. Now, I've made my lighthouse slightly bigger here, but it's a picture of a lighthouse, so... I don't mind, you know, going big on the subject, if you know what I mean. Now, one of the things I've probably found the hardest to come to terms with and understand how to sketch is things like rolling grass tufts and, you know, very linear, very flat, planar landscapes that have subtle variations in texture and subtle variations in colour. I struggle with that, I think, probably more than say buildings or skies or uh, even water actually so uh, one of the ways I've tried to resolve that in the past is by using is by not painting everything it's just choosing little elements little dots of color within the landscape uh, and focusing on those and not trying to be too clever getting that perfect tone throughout the whole of the landscape another way that I've tried to so maybe fudge it in a way is maybe maybe it's not fudging I don't know is used to be very very uh, gestural with my painting so I'll splat it on or I will create some uh, lots of shapes and textures uh, with the brush to try and break up colors but the more I learned to paint and the more further I got on with it one of the things I I really start to appreciate is when you're laying down your uh, you're building up the layers with watercolor because you know it is a transparent medium so you will have layer upon layer but the first the first layer you put down try and vary the pigment within the first layer so you're not going to take a green uh, whether it's the sap green that you can see in my palette here you're not even going to mix up a green and 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 use your mixed green which is you know you take a blue take a yellow mix that up what you're going to do is you're going to take a little bit of green add that in maybe dilute it on the page and you're going to take a little bit of sienna and a little bit of Van Dyke Brown and, and you're going to mix it on the page as you go. And that creates some wonderful variation. And you'll see some examples of that as I go in to paint some of these elements. I just want to point out something here as I'm riffing and indulging in my own voice. <laughs> um, and I can never listen to these videos back because it just makes me cringe horribly. And you may notice that I have two yellows. Well, actually, I've got what looks like three, four yellows in my palette, but I suppose, strictly speaking, there's only two yellows. Now, they're uh, Hansa yellows. And um, the reason why I've got two in my palette is because I tend to use one to mix with. So I'll use one primarily to mix with blue to make greens, and the other one I like to keep as a clean colour so that I can mix it with reds and um, and different colours to, you know, to change that pigment. So I tend to have what I call a mucky yellow and a clean yellow. So what I'm doing now is I'm just taking these pencil lines as guides and I am putting my line work in. I'm using here one of the inks that I use for most of my line and wash stuff, which is Platinum Carbon Black. Um, you, I normally tend to buy it in, uh, in whole bottles and I actually fill my cartridges up with just I've got a little syringe that I use specifically for filling up my my cartridges. Now this little Kawako or Kaveco uh, fountain pen is a fabulous little lightweight cheap cheapo job, and I've had it for years. Um, but it's got a tiny little cartridge in, so that that tends to uh, to run out pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, the platinum carbon black ink is waterproof. It doesn't seem to bung up fountain pens very much. Uh, I've never had a problem uh, with it bunging. I've used it in parallel pens, dip pens, all sorts of pens. Uh, I've never had a problem with it drying and um, and bugging a pen up. I've had a few pens dry up with it in, and and I've managed to be able to flush them out okay. I obviously haven't locked focus here again. I keep forgetting to do that. What was chuntering on about? Yeah, ink. 
so the platinum carbon black ink is great it doesn't tend to bung the pens up uh, i definitely would recommend it but you have to make sure it's properly dry before you put watercolor on and um, if you're outdoors and you don't have access to a, a hairdryer you know you've got to leave it 10 minutes till it's properly dry because if you put water on it and it's not properly dry it will run so the eagle eyed amongst you will have spotted that i am actually using this fountain pen upside down i'm using the top of the nib instead of the ball uh, of the nib on the bottom now i'm doing that because with this particular pen because the profile of the nib you do get a slightly thinner line and you also get a slightly scratchier uh, a, sc a scratchier feel which weirdly actually helps you control it um, but everyone's very different and some people probably wouldn't feel comfortable working that way it's fine for me um, weirdly I find this pen really really comfortable despite having 90th percentile I've got massive hands uh, you know I've struggled to get gloves to fit me things like that and uh, this pen despite it being absolutely tiny I, fi I find it it actually is very comfortable but i think that's because it sits within my palm the other pen that i love to use that's really comfortable is my opus 88 and that is a monster you know it's 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 a girthy pen it's it's quite a um a, it'd be too big for a lot of people to hold but i know people who have tried to write with it who find it uncomfortable because it's just too thick um so it's weird i find anything in the middle you know i think lamy safaris are wonderful pens but they're not the most comfortable things to hold. So really this part of the drawing I think is somewhat uh, superfluous to show. So I am going to fast forward it a little bit here uh, just to get to the end of the pen, pen work. Okay so as you can see here I'm a uh, I've got a bit of a lick on now. Um, I've got a bit of a steg on, as we'd say, in North Yorkshire. And, um, yeah, we, we, we're cracking on with all those little windows. I think this is about A4, and as I say, the other version of this I did was 7x5, so it was, you know, less than half of this. Uh, and actually, weirdly, I prefer the other version, but maybe that was just because the paper's, you know, slightly different. I don't know. Um, here, I'm just adding some line work i'm not quite sure why i did that uh i know there is a few rough lines on the reference drawing there okay so we're in the painting stage now so what i've done is i've wet down the whole of the sky uh you don't have to be super accurate in terms of getting it perfect on the horizon and you can actually overflow to a certain extent unless you actually want to be leaving elements white so any element that you want to leave white you cannot go over the top of you could use tissue to lift it but just try and be careful here but that sky is going to be a wet in wet sky because we're trying to create a diffuse soft beautiful clouds now if you look in the reference image there it's actually quite a spectacular sky and I don't, I'm not 100% sure I actually captured it with this and I, I think it's again something I could revisit really so here i'm just making sure that the page the paper is nice and wet and i've sort of accurately covered it all uh, you can see you, you can probably see the sort of reflective nature of it now when you um when you, you've properly covered the whole pay uh the sky area um it's probably worth a, worth dropping on a little bit more water, splash it on and work it back over the whole area, but then leave it and wait till it goes ever so slightly matte. You can see um, if you tilt it towards the light source, you will see where it's shiny and where it's matte because water will stand on the surface and then slowly dissolve in. So what I'm choosing here is I'm actually just choosing some neutral tint, which actually I think in retrospect was a mistake. I should have had some colour in it should have had quite a, a little bit of blue in there or something because it looks neutral tint is is something that you would add to other colors to darken them um not in the same way it doesn't quite work in the same way as black and colors like that it's um i mean it's a that's a sort of tutorial in its own right talking about neutral tint but what i'm basically doing is i'm starting in that top right corner normally i would start in either corner because that's where it's darkest 
um, uh, and you get more pigment. And then what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to have a play with a rigger brush, which is a long, thin brush, to drag some elements in. Um, I'm really sort of messing about on the job with this and just sort of trying this, trying that. One of the things I really recommend, and I should have done it here, is if you're doing a picture like this that really does hang on the first element, do you know what I mean? It's like if you screw up the sky, uh, everything you've done up to this point will have to be redone. You should not be doing a drawing that takes 10 minutes. Just sketch. Get some some spare bits of paper ideally the same paper you're doing the, the final drawing on because then you know exactly how that paper feels and how it behaves and sketch in a horizon you know, don't put all the details of the bottom of the picture in there's no need for that just sketch in a horizon line and do a practice sky do three or four practice skies try some different things see what effects you get uh, i'm kind of at the point with my watercolor where uh, I can get a feel for for things, so I can kind of have a play, try that, take it off, put it back on again, and to a certain extent, I know how far I can sort of push things. Uh, but that that said, I still make mistakes. You know, we all make mistakes. Um, the other thing that's interesting here, we're looking just looking at this now, is is looking at the kind of quality of this paper. Uh, and the characteristics of it it's it's really not like a lot of other paper i've used before it's quite interesting actually um yeah it's it's quite interesting to see i think one of the things is it hasn't really held a lot of the water so uh, what i could have done here is i could have gone back in and i could have used a spray can you know, uh, a water sprayer and uh, uh, I can't really call them. It's like a plant moisture thing. Uh, I have some little aerosol uh, spray on cans of water and added a little bit more water to the um, to that top part of the page. So again, I'm not trying to 100% replicate here exactly what is happening with this drawing. You know. I'm, that's not really the point of this this exercise or actually most of my art is that you know I'm not trying to 100 percent replicate how that looks I'm trying to sort of capture the feel of it as much as anything so again I'm using that little rigger brush there uh, I'm dragging some paint in and pushing some of it out mixing it up trying to sort of get a feel for the same sort of effect that we see in the reference drawing No, as you can see, that's there's still quite a lot of moisture there, but I just want to make sure that I'm running that right down into the houses so that it, you don't leave a white line around the houses because that can look can look a bit weird. Now, if anything looks too strong here, what I'm doing is I'm going back to some clean water, lifting up a little bit of clean water and just working it in to try and soften like areas like just there. See, I'm going back to some clean water there. Just softening that a little bit. Right, so what I'm trying to do in some of these bits here is I've got some it's clean water on the brush, and I've dry, then I've dried it, and then I'm pu I'm pushing that uh, dry, clean brush uh, through the the quite wet paint, and what it's doing is it's lifting off some of that darker darker pigment, and the lifting off of the paint is another way of creating um, uh, lighter areas within a, a darker wash. So I'm having a little bit of a play on this side and just finishing off, trying to bring that down to the ground. I think it's just to extend the picture of the sky across because I'm, as you can see, the ground is going f much further over the, uh, uh, much further over than the sky. Uh, you can see I've had a bit of a problem an issue there with the paper. Um, or maybe I've dropped on some water, but it's created a bit of a blob in that top right-hand corner, which isn't ideal, really. Uh, it just tends to draw the eye. I'm 
Okay, so really now that's going to be that's going to have a really good hair dry, and then we're going to go and start adding some uh, some of the colour. Now, in terms of uh, the sort of layers of how you would add the colour in here, normally if I was going to be painting the whole scene, I probably would have gone in and done either the road or started on some of the sort of foliage. But I think because I wasn't 100% sure how much I was going to paint of this image, I wasn't sure whether I was just going to put in the rooftops and then leave the sky exactly how it is. Um, it's also worth noting here just how much paler. So hopefully you can see here that the sky has dried significantly lighter than it looked before so it um that is the th one of the things that's obviously quite noticeable about you know whether it's dye based inks or um watercolor pigments is is they tend to look a lot richer when they're wet so often you can you can if it, if you put a wash on and you think oh it's actually a bit dark you know when it dries it won't be uh it won't be that dark I'm using a tiny little fiddly uh, travel brush that I have here, which is a fine, quite a fine tip. So now, as you can see, I'm mixing up some of the the colour for the lighthouse. The colour for the lighthouse has got a little bit more uh, quinacridone rose I'm putting in here, so it's got a little, it's a, bit, a little more sort of rose colour than the. Um, the transparent red oxide that sort of orange colour that I've used for the tiles, the pan tiles. So I don't know why I'm fiddling around with this stupid little thin brush here. I should have just got a much bigger brush, and um, I seem to be really making a bit of a a meal of this this lighthouse. Okay, so now we're on to the um, the foliage, or the, the grass, I guess, uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, now what I'm doing here is I'm mixing a little bit of the Madder, uh, the, sorry, the Quidacodome, um rose here, a little bit of blue, um, all on the same brush, and sort of dotting it in. So that's a little bit of... Um, the, I think that's a transoxide brown or not. I wonder what that colour is. So I'm a little bit of brown, a little bit of green, and then I'm mixing a little bit of green in there, so a little bit of sap green. Um, and then that sort of sits all in one little puddle. And again, I'm working on those boundaries. I'm working on those zones. Now, my original plan, I think, was to very much leave this as something like that. Was to leave it quite minimal. And truthfully, I wished I had. I think I like that more. I think that's more interesting than ultimately when I carried on painting. But I think I was just in a bit of a roll. And I thought, oh, I'll carry on. One of the things that... Um, I find with selective colouring, which is when you just colour certain areas of the images, and never quite a hundred percent sure how to what to colour in, what not to colour in, unless I'm basing those choices on something similar that I've seen another artist do, and I basically copy because I know I like it. Because it's all very well saying what works and what doesn't work, but what what does that mean? I mean, for me, it's whether I like it or not. Uh, because damn straight, you know, I'm not I'm not going to be producing anything that I don't like the look of. Uh, unless I'm getting paid handsomely. Um, I'm such a mercenary. But we kind of get into the point with this where it's becoming a little bit overworked in a way in terms of selective colouring. Like, you really want to leave it there. Definitely, that's almost too much. Um, and what I was, I was going to say was if you're not sure about how to selectively colour a, a, a picture, do the line work and then photocopy or photograph it and print it 
Um, I've been told, now I might be wrong, that if you get it laser copied, you can actually put watercolour over the top of it and it won't run. But even in inkjet, it will run. But it doesn't, it stays there long enough for you to actually use those lines and get a feel. So, um, yeah, print off some small versions, maybe four or five, you know, however many you want, and um, do some practices. And try and, you know, try just painting the man-made elements of the picture and leaving the other elements unpainted or do the opposite. Leave all the other elements within the picture that are man-made unpainted and just do the foliage. Uh, there's lots of different approaches and some work better than others for certain pictures. And, in my, you know, at the end of the day, it's finding it's finding what you like, I think. That's, that's important. I think another potential approach to this drawing would have been to use a similar tone to the sky, you know, that really dark, dark grey, and just work that into the road. If this had been very textured paper, such as cardi paper or rough watercolour paper, you could have done some really nice dry brush techniques on the foreground by dragging a big brush right across to create the surface of the road and that would have been a lovely lead in actually or you could have uh, put down some really dark gray and then put on some bright color on the top of that you know so the yellow of the road stripe or, or something so i think at this point really um so i think at this point i still hadn't quite decided whether i was going to go ahead and uh, do much more on this but I still had a little bit of wet paint lying around so I utilized it by again getting in that large rigger brush and um, and using it just to drag some of the wet paint up and about and that helps giving things a bit of texture uh, so just to sort of make a suggestion of this is grass so you can see on the right hand side there's um, it's bigger because it's close to the camera and as we get further to the camera it gets it's supposed to, you know, those grass details would get smaller and smaller. Uh, and again, just for contrast here, I think I'm using the back of the brush. Uh, just to, to, to see if adding a few little extra details in the hyper you in know, the super foreground, you know, there uh, will help. So I think for this, this stage here, it's obviously had a hair dry. It's come back. I've thought about it and I've gone... Do you know what? I'm just going to stick a lot more paint on there. Um, so then I, th I think I've gone for it in a bit more of a big way. So there we put in the road in. Uh, uh, I think what I've done here is I've mixed up some... Um, or maybe I've just pulled off some of that neutral tint. I think I have, yeah. Which which is the right colour to use because it it probably does want to reflect the uh, sky a little bit. But I mean, again, the problem with neutral tint is it it's a neutral tint. It doesn't have a lot of sort of colour and feel to uh, to itself. Um. Uh, yeah, it's not a particularly good coverage as well. really not a big fan of big flat washes i always just look at them and go Neh. um i think if you're going to be doing a big flat wash it's always great to put two or three different colors in or 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 use a dry brush technique or something just to break up that monotone so this is a beautiful little um, collection of so here what I've done is I've just to uh, turn the um, the picture upside down um, so that I can get a little bit closer to the dry um, without so here I've just turned the image upside down so that I can touch the dry bit of the sky and not put my hand on the wet road and that means that I can uh, sketch in these shadows and also put a little bit of shadow on the side of the lighthouse there. So 
So really, there's um, there's not a few. There's there is a few more touches here, but I think it's it, it's more of a last minute decision. But what I've done is I've gone in and I've used the Posca pen to try and get these yellow um, lines put in on the road, and I've added in the the yellow post details as well. Right, so the fine liner here, the last bit, I'm using the grey fine liner here to sort of put in the the window details. Often for windows, I'll just use black, but because it's so far away in the background, I'm, I'm going for a, a grey just because it's um, it's a little bit softer, really. I have tried um, Unipin fine liners do come in three different colours. There's a light grey, a dark grey, and obviously black. I think they actually do some red ones and blue ones as well, which I'd yeah, I'd love to try. The light grey is, is not worth using. It's too light. It just literally disappears on the page. Um, whereas the dark grey actually, depending on the line thickness, you know, if you use it in one of the thin ones. It, it is very light, um, but if you want a dark, if you want it to be darker, just use literally use a thicker one. So what I'm doing here is I am trying to break up um, this flat wash for the road by using a, a sort of dragging brush technique. Here it doesn't work so well with this paper because it's just too th it's too finely textured, uh, but again it just looks slightly more um, natural somehow because you know you just don't get those flat colours. And then I think um, adding in some texture. Uh, I love, I always love spatters, and particularly if, if it's bright colours or different colours, or you know, it's. I often think it's just nice to add a little bit of interest and texture. You may have noticed that some of that's gone in the sky. Sometimes I just leave it. I go fine, I leave that there. Other times I'll go in with a tissue and just and just dab it out, and that tends to even if it leaves a tiny mark tends to get the worst of it out if you're really bothered about over splash you know cover the sky before you do it just leave the area that you want the spatters on um you know exposed so i think what i've done here is i've done that thing of looking at it right at the last minute and going do you know what i think it needs this uh i've already Often, if I'm doing pictures like like this, I will I will take a photo of it at, at the last few stages, and then I'll go back and I'll have a look at those photos, and I'll go when should I have stopped? Um, and often, if you if you overwork a piece, which you know it's, it's one of the things I do most most often, if I said that you know I look back and on my work um, regrets, if you know what I mean, about certain pieces, it's that they they ultimately were overworked and too fussy. Um, I think that's probably something I'm quite guilty of. Um, but at least if you photograph it at different stages, it gives you a little bit of an idea and you can go, well, you know, this is where I should have stopped. Or just start your own YouTube channel and, uh, and then you've got a record of it for a perpetuity and after. <laughs> Sorry, great jokes. Um, so I think what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to add in a little bit more dark contrast between these foreground and background layers 
and I think yeah this is very much in danger of being thrown away in the last the last nine minutes of the match but you know it doesn't matter it's a fun little exercise So there you go. And there's the end result. I think there's some really interesting elements in that picture. I think some of it didn't work out quite so well. I mean, I think partly it's just my own familiarity with the paper. Um, but I think there's a lot of interesting textures and it certainly has a nice feel about it. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, we'll see you next time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.